So assignment four is out and the link was corrected. Um, the hardest part about assignment four will be to making it work on AWS Spark. Um, other than that, it should be fairly simple. It's given a data set from the United States presidential election in 2016. Um, well, there's a data set of all donations given to all candidates. By all candidates, we mean all candidates running for office that year, not just a presidential office. So it's all the um, senators and representatives, et cetera. So there's the actual data set is just under four gigs in size. Um, so just asking several questions like, well, how many people donated to each presidential candidate? You know, what's the total amount donated to each presidential candidate? Um, and then, you know, looking at, you know, how how many small donator, donors were there and distribution of donators to each candidate um, and produce a histogram. Well, the problem is you can't, you can't you're not going to be able to use either the Spark to produce a histogram because you basically do it remotely. Um, so, so what you want to do is you want to generate the data you need for the histogram and then write it to a file and download the file and then use regular Python to actually produce the histogram. You don't want to use Spark to do plot, I mean, plots and figures, right? Yeah, to your, your local machine, right? Um, so then you need to read that data in using Spark locally and, and then convert it from a Spark data frame to a Python data frame. So you can then use Seaborn to do a simple histogram, right? Um, do it in one notebook um, so that one challenge in then is when you do it in AWS, you need a program, right? And so write, write a, a function which does your program, right? And then you run it in AWS, but then you could copy that and put it in a notebook, not to be run in the notebook, right? Um, and there's two ways I'll know if you've done it on AWS. One is I I put the full data set in AWS and I, because I didn't think, do you really want to download a four gig file and then upload it again? You know, so I uploaded it once and put it in a bucket that should should be world readable. Um, and I'm sure someone will let me know if it's not. Um, and the other way is um, when you run a job in AWS, you can create an AWS command line tool, you know, right? And you just click on a button, it shows you, and then it shows you right at this big long command to actually execute your job. Um, and so you copy that and put that also in your notebook. Um, the assignment gives you the I mean, it's, it's basically s you know s two colon slash slash then I, I gave you the full path yeah yeah otherwise I mean plus it's got a weird name I just downloaded it from the federal government and so I had to download the four gigabyte file and then upload it again right. It's better. Um, it seemed better to do it once rather than repeat it multiple times.
other news, I'm not sure why, but the last two lectures, I'm getting a lot of noise on the recording. Um, I'm assuming it's a radio interference. Um, it's only happened in this room. And then this afternoon, result, well, I'm only using this set in this room to record lectures. So it could be something else. But um, the first couple of times I did it in the beginning of the semester, I got this. Um, lots of times, yeah, just the noise is just, I mean, you can't hear anything but a buzz, right? Just the audio is just completely worthless. I mean, it's, and I just tested it in a short file and it was fine. So we'll see. Um, yeah, I don't necessarily expect you to be able to find a desk at that large. That depends on what you're doing, right? Um, you know, presumably you have a data set, you know, you're going to do some analysis and explain things that I tried this. You might be trying different algorithms on it to see how they perform, or you might be trying to understand what the data is telling you. Um, you know, if you look at the Kaggle site, um, they tend to go overboard. Well, there's two types of Kegel results. If you go there and someone is like, it goes on for a long, long time. This guy's, I mean, they spent, you know, weeks and weeks on this, right? Um, so those are the ones that are looking for really serious, will find a job, right? So like, and then there's like someone, oh, I just, I just spent an hour doing something. And I think everyone needs to know about it, right? Um, And actually, I was looking at uh, the Berkeley course. And for one of their assignments, they said, you have to submit this to Kegel. That was, that was, one, of their, that was one of their assignments. It's like, you know, and then, any other questions? Yes, I mean, I do this in my other class, right? And the, the, there are a couple of reasons for doing it. And one is, you know, are you trying to do something this big or are you trying to do something this big, right? Um, so what I want to do is next Thursday, have the class dedicated to that. And then we'll see how far we get. We may have to do this bill over the next week. So come prepare to talk about your project then. Any other questions? So I want to talk about something. I want to leave Spark for a while. We'll come back to it. Um, so another problem we have when you have large volumes of data is um, getting it from place to place. And if the data is being continuously generated, you have a stream, right? Um, so then how do you get it from, you may have, multiple sites generating the data and streaming it to where you want to be. Um, how do you how do you do that, particularly when there's a large volume of it? Or it might be bursty, right? It might be, you know, maybe you're a US company and 
you know, from midnight to six in the morning, nothing happens. And all of a sudden the East Coast lights up and then data comes in and then, you know, say the stock exchange, right? I mean, it shut down, there's no orders and all of a sudden, bam, right? You start getting, and then the, the Fed chairman says something or some company says something or, you know, Apple and Qualcomm settle the suit and all of a sudden, there's this huge volume of, you know, uh, sales and buy orders for Qualcomm stock, right? And so you got this huge spike, right? So all of a sudden, you need to be able to scale this thing, right? Um, and so Kafka is a service that we can that is used to do that. Um, and yeah, the problem is. You know, what happens when you get lots and lots of things, you know, beating on a single source, right? Um, well, then what you do is, oh, you replicate the database, but now you have to worry about communication, right? Um, and, you know, then you have other systems that are interacting, right? So often in a large corporation, you've got, two types of traffic coming into your database. Um, you know, your billing information, inventory invitation, and, and you also want, this, you continually generating reports, you know, what's going on now. Um, and then you might have other people, just customers banging on to find out, you know, where's the order, I'm ordering stuff. Um, And you know now this the story is well, you know ten years ago, you built a back end and you built an application right, and you everyone talked to the application and then the application talked to the database um, depending upon what terminology you want microservices or lambdas or serverless were or now instead of having one application do lots of things, you break it down into single small little slices right and each one will talk to the database um and so all of a sudden you're getting lots of things talking to each other right um and that just that's just painful right it doesn't scale well and then you have to worry about who is talking to who and did i get the right data from that other person right and someone else adds two or three more services and no now I have to go back and make sure that other things talk to it or hear from it. And it's like, unless you're a graph theorist, you don't like to see you don't like to see graphs like that, right? It's, it's not a good idea. Um, so yeah, put something in the middle, right? And then everyone talks to it, and then they can get the information they need. Um, and so Kafka helps solve that problem. And there are sort of three separate problems we'll talk about. Um, um, so Kafka is going to operate slightly differently than you're used to. Um, and so one of the key data structures used in Kafka is a log file. Um, and so there was yeah, this article by the developer of Kafka talks about why logs are, are important. Um, and you know log file is this a sequence of of records, right? That's it. And the the sequence um, actually is it, is very fast to append to a file, right? You can open up a file descriptor, get a pointer to the end of the file, and just write and write and write. And it's fairly fast because the operating system, you know, buffers that write, right? So you write the buffer, and then it and it's a lot faster than you think when you just are appending, right? Um, 
And actually, you know, since I talked about um, Wall Street, for them, time really is money, right? There is, there's actually a, a movie that sort of about this. At one point, a company in Chicago um, actually laid fiber after cable from Chicago to New York. Why? Because they were able to make it shorter distance than the current connection you had, which meant that their sell and buy orders from Chicago to New York Stock Exchange would reach their, it only had to be a millisecond before anyone else, right? And so it was, it was worth their while to spend the money to lay this fiber cable from Chicago to, I mean, that's, I mean, when you look at the map, it looks pretty close, but I mean, no, this is a big country. This is a long way, right? Um, so for them, time really is money. Um, and you know, how do you, when you have a database, you make a request, you know, how do you make sure that when the database crashes that you can recover, right? And so they begin to they write logs, right? And, and again, if you're just appending the log file of a transaction, it can be very quick. It's a lot quicker than actually updating the database. The database, you have to find the right row and write the column and blah, blah, blah. Well, the log file is just like, you know, you're appending a file and you're saying, you know, update. And, and this is the thing you're updating, right? You don't have to, you don't have to find it. You don't have to find the row. You don't have to lock the row, lock columns, right? You just write, say, here's the SQL statement I'm going to execute. Done, right? Um, so it's actually quite fast. And that way, if things crash, um, you can then look at that log and, and replay it, right? Um, and so we can actually replay. I mean, if we crash, we can replay that log, right? Um, let's see, can I can remember, it, uh, not accurate, no, it's atom atomic. But it turns out that if you want a really fast database, um, you don't bother with storing tables on the, on the, you do it all, keep it all in memory. And then you just record all the transactions in a log file. Why? Because it's faster. And so a lot of, a lot of the Wall Street firms, you know, their databases are stored in memory. Um, because then when you make a, request right you can do it in memory very fast and you log the trend i mean just log the sql statement you you executed um otherwise if you're using oracle or postgres i mean you the files are on the on the disk drive and update them and you do all this work right no no just just that log file becomes your database and then what you do is occasionally take a snapshot of memory and uh, save that. And then you can shrink the log and then start over again, right? And you read this. And then if you do it, if you're clever, you just you can just save objects, right? You just serialize whatever objects you've got in their memory and just save it. Um, and it's a lot faster. I mean, it's significantly faster. Um, I actually have a t-shirt that a company gave me years ago, and they claimed that they were like 10 times, 10,000 times faster in Oracle because they did everything in memory, right? There was no, there's no disk access except to write the log file. Um, and so, yeah, we can talk about, you know, what do we want to log? Do we want to log, right? 
the state of the row or just log the SQL statement, right? And logging the SQL statement is going to be faster because we don't have to access the row. I mean, just the request comes in, you write it's a log file, and then you process the request, right? Um, and yeah, once you got a log file, you, you got the history. Um, and it, it's now become a, an issue with, with databases. Um, so there's one database um, that I know about. Um, you cannot change any data, right? It keeps track. It's, it's basically a write-only database. I mean, it's a read-only. You can add things, but you can't. You can't remove data, right? So when you modify a row, you get a, a new. You get a copy of that row. So you keep a history of all that transactions because, well, if you're doing financial transactions, you need to have a, you need to know all those things that happened, right? Um, and an in-memory database, right? You just give the current state of the tables, whatever in memory, and you write every change you make, you, you log in a log file um, to be fast. And then you can restart the database. Um, if you got that history, you can replay it to see what happened and why it happened. No, you. The log is written to the file, right? Yeah. Otherwise, you you're in trouble. Um. What if your database doesn't fit in memory? Yep, um, there are databases that big, but how much memory can we fit on a machine these days? You know, 500 gigabytes isn't that much anymore. And that's a, that's a lot of data. So yeah, I mean that's um, you can't do that, but you can. Um, a lot of databases will actually fit in, in memory. And now another issue that comes up is um, what happens if. You can't keep up with requests to process things in a database, right? When one machine isn't fast enough, well, we need to replicate. There are various ways we can do that. One is we can divide data into partitions, right, and put each put each partition on a different machine. But then when a request comes in, we have to figure out which partition is relevant. And if you're doing an SQL database, the problem is that, oh, that query might need a table from there and a table from there. Uh, that's a problem. So another thing you can do is just create a, um, you know, create separate copies of the database, right, in different machines. Um, and so one way to do it is, well, we have a master. Whenever you do a write, you do it to the master. And whenever you just do a read, we do it on, we can do it on the slaves, right? But how do we keep things consistent? Um, well, um, whenever the master changes, right, we can write to a log file, and that can then be distributed um, to all the slaves, and they can be, can be processing, right, all those changes to keep up. We will not, we won't be completely acid, right, because um, there is going to be delay in doing that, but it's fairly small. Um, or if you really want to be clever, we can do, do all your writes to the log file, and then everyone just reads that log file, right? And then all your reads 
are, are done from the database. Yeah, so let's inverse it, right? I mean, we think of, oh, I write to the, you know, I, I do a write to the database and it creates a log file, right? Uh, but here what we do is we write to the log file and then the database reads the log file to update itself, which is, right? Now what you, not the normal way you think of doing things, right? You usually think of, oh, I made a change to the server and so the server is gonna write a log file to keep track of what it did as opposed to now we're gonna like, okay, we're gonna all writes go to the log file and then we right, use that to process the data, update our databases. And of course you're wondering why, um, yeah, wondering why we're talking about this when we're, when we're talking about Kafka and distributed processing. Um, So another problem is, or common issue is dealing with a message system. Um, and if you've taken an operating system course and talked about producers and consumers, right, this is a standard problem. And so we have some sort of queue, right? And producers are dumping things in the queue and at the other end of the queue, people are reading it. Um, this is, become um, a growing trend in application architecture um, where you have parts of your program are producing data and they just dump it on a message system and then other parts that are consuming it um, can then just read from this, this queued thing. Um, so I mentioned microservices or um, you know, one way to do that is you have a message system where some of your microservices are just producing data and they just put it on this on this queue and then other parts can then read what they want, right? Um, and the issue with this classic picture is that, you know, once you read, you know, once one of the consumers pulls something off the queue, it's gone, right? Um, you know, another way of dealing with this is, um, you know, probably subscribe or do a broadcast where, you know, consumers can register themselves to, you know, with a producer and say, when you produce something, let me know, right? When there's a new event, send it to me. Um, Kafka is written either in Java or Scala, but um, both these models are everywhere, right? Um, this, this publish subscribe is a common pattern. Um, you start to see it now. It's even popular in applications doing reactive programming, where the part of the program that generates events, um, and then other parts that register themselves. You know, when that event is, I, I want to know about that event, right? And so the. One popular trend is reactive programming at the UI side. And so there's, you know, Facebook has the React system where you've got GUI components that will register themselves. I want, whenever that data changes, let me know. Um, and so then when you write the application, all you have to do is update the data and then all necessary UI components update themselves automatically. Um, so yeah, this happens. 
lots and lots of places. Um, but like I said, it doesn't scale very well. So when Java first came out, um, you know, there's all these mouse events, right, and keyboard events, and right, mouse click events that happen, um, and it was a general broadcast, and people soon found out that you no. Know, you know, all the demo programs Sun produced were great, but when you had a more complicated GUI, there was too many events, and every single person GUI element was getting all the events, and it just took too long to broadcast to everybody. Um, so the, it didn't scale very well. Um, You know, then we can sort of create, you know, a common bus so that we just dump them on the bus and then people listen to it. But again, you have to worry about this this bus thing getting overloaded if you're producing too many things. Um, so these systems particularly when we're talking about distributed systems where we have a messaging system for multiple machines, um, failure is a problem. You know, what happens when an event occurred and the queue is full, now what, do you ha now what happens? Um, and if we're in multiple machines, how do you make sure things, I mean, we're not, one machine is doing all the work. Um, You know, so various issues. What happens when a publisher fails, or a consumer fails, um, and know that keeping track of this fails. Um, and so Kafka wants to solve all these problems. It wants to be scalable. When a node goes down, we can recover. Um, There's, they talk about some different delivery semantics. Um, you know, one is at most what happens um, if we deliver the message and in, in the middle of that, the consumer goes, the producer goes down, right? So I'm like, okay, did it actually, did I send, did it actually get to the other end or not, right? Um, and so you, what do you do? You do, you rebroadcast it again to make sure it got there, but then you end up with, you end up with two copies of the same message, right? Um, and so that's at most once, right? If, if I think I sent it, then, and I crash, I restart again, and okay, just forget, I mean, if you thought you sent it, don't resend it, right? Um, at least once, so I, I, on the a process of sending, the process goes down, and now I restart, did I send, did it get there? Don't know, so send it again, right? But you may end up with more, the same message multiple times. Um, and this is, what, this is what you want, right? You want to guarantee that it gets sent, and it only gets sent once, right? So with that background, we can now talk about Kafka, right? Um, and they don't want to call themselves a messaging system because it, they think it's too limiting, so it's a Unified, high throughput, low latency platform for handling real time data feeds, right? Um, fancy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it came, it came out of LinkedIn. Um, the name comes from the, the author, the tech author, who um, his books are very interesting. Um, a lot of them deal with 
you know, bizarre stories with bureaucracy and, you know, some guy goes to the castle and he never comes out again, right? But he can just monitor him and they shovel him back all over the place. Um, and the guy who wrote the system really liked Kafka's work, so you get to pick a name, right? Um, so there is now a company that, you know, sort of manages Kafka. Um, it came out 2011. You know, I think, you know, a couple of years ago we had version one. I think we're at version two something now. Um, and it's, yeah, I mean, it, you know, so it's a company and so they have all these, you know, wonderful stories about who uses it. Um, and again, all this information is several years old. Um, so, Net, I mean, Netflix is even bigger and has more people, right? So, but, I mean, 700 billion messages a day is not bad, right? Um, right, and you know, Spotify at the time used it. To, I mean, you have this all these cl this cluster doing stuff, and so you write all all the logs. They use it, um, Kafka to write write the logs to one place, right? Because it's sort of painful when you have you know 100 machines and each one has a separate log file, and then you want to find something, we have to log on each machine. No, it's not going to work, right? So all the logs get sent to a central location and written to one file. Um, so they use Kafka to do that. So these companies with lots of data are, are using it to help move the data around. Um, when you run Kafka, you also get to run Zookeeper. Um, the, the problem that Zookeeper solves, you probably don't know you have yet unless you've done things like this. this. You have a cluster of 10, 50, 100 machines, and you want them all configured, right? So do you want to log on to every machine and type in the same commands and load the same file? And then, no, right? Um, and so, Use a zookeeper to be able to uh, basically send configuration files. To, you, know, you send it a zookeeper and it sends it all out, right? And then Kafka will run multiple machines. And so you first you run zookeeper, so you can, you can you tell zookeeper, here's my configuration file. And then when you run Kafka, right, it knows. Um, it helps you configure your, your Kafka system. Um, and we'll see that. Um, actually, I thought I updated this slide, but it's you know, we're past 1.1 now. I think we're at about 2 something. Um, Yeah, so terminology gets slightly confusing for a bit. Um, so instead of having one stream we publish to, we can have multiple streams. Um, another complication is that we will then use multiple machines for to do this. Um, that way, um, that's how you get the throughput. You have more machines, right? And so we, but we can have what they call a channel, and a channel can be spread across multiple machines, and so clients can talk to a different machine. Um, and having multiple machines means if one machine goes down, we've still got that channel of information still available on other machines. Um, right, so yeah, we. We run on a cluster of one or more machines. Um, it stores the streams as records, and what they call topics. So 
you create different topics for different types of information. Um, and then each record is this key value pair with a timestamp. And the timestamp is important so we can know when it occurred. Um, we have you know producer and that just it just sends a record to a to a topic right and so it could be you know if you spotify it the producer is just a program that you know is right into you know every log entry go it becomes and becomes a sent to a topic right um the other end um you got a consumer which can read data from kafka i mean take it out um and there are streams um and then connectors so we can actually you know if we wanted to, we could connect it to a database so the stuff data in the connectors, you know, pushes it to a database. Um, right, so we have we can have producers, you know, and is that it sounds like a complicated thing, but in Java or Python it just becomes you know they've written the code so you just basically call a method say you know here's a topic and the topic here's the key here's the value and then send it to that topic that's it right so it's basically create the topic create the record send it to that topic right so you connect to a kafka server what topic you're interested in and that's it right so it's um and the consumers is, is basically again when you do it it's, it's pretty straightforward is to again you have a method to call to connect to the kafka system and you need to know right the location of the kafka server and you want to know what topic you're interested in um and then you can basically read a record and read a record and streaming as well we might have a stream that we're just pushing data into the kafka system So when you look at just producers and consumers, um, a Kafka cluster has a bunch of topics and the topic is whatever you want, right? Um, and um, when we write to it, we partition it into different machines um, and consumers, we can read from a particular topic. So now we've got consumers and producers, and we've got topics and partitions, right? Um, so a topic is just a category for a stream of records, right? Music or log file or right, whatever we want. Um, and as many consumers as they want can subscribe to it and it can have multiple partitions um and a partition basically is a log of all the records in that right um and as opposed to spark we write things this is basically a log file you write every time a producer pushes something into that topic we write it to a log log file, um, and each partition goes on a different machine, and we also replicate partitions, right? So a particular partition will exist on multiple machines for redundancy, and as records come in, they're given an ID. Sequential ID one, two, three, four, five. Um, but it's just a 
This is basically like a Java array list, right? That's written to this. The partitions help do several things, mainly one is the throughput, since we get multiple partitions on different machines. So if I have a, a given topic on three machines, that means that different consumers can connect to a different machine and read. So we, we, we've increased our throughput by a factor of three, right? Um, having partitions um, replicated gives us redundancy. So if the machine goes down or becomes on no longer, we can connect to it, we have a backup. Um, And since these things are written to disk, right? It's we don't, um, we've got a record of them, which means if a new client connects later on, if they want to, they can start reading the records in that topic from the beginning all the way to the current time. So it's not like the publish describe method where when you describe, you get all events that happen from then on. It's like, no, we have a record of all the events that are written to that particular topic. So if you want them all, you get them all. If you just want ones from now forward, you can do that too. Also, if a client goes down and you've read the first 10 and knows the clients remember the last record they read, they can when they come back up again, they can start from where they left off. And it's, you know, how long you want to keep those records? Well, it's up to you, right? Um, once it's read, you may want to get rid of it, or you may want to keep it for a day, a week, a month. I mean, it's, it's something we can figure how long those records stay in that particular partition. Um, and since it's a log file, right? I mean, adding, we're just depending. So it doesn't matter how big the file is, as long as it fits on the disk and And the server maintains right offset for each uh, consumer, um, and that's all we need to know about the consumers. Just where are they? And you know, consumers can go ahead; they can go backwards; they can just basically, say, you know, where do I, where do I want to read from? Um, So when we have partitions, one of the partitions becomes a leader, right? They're in control. Um, and so, you, you know, if you've got three machines and all your topics are replicated across multiple, all three machines, each machine will be a leader on different topics. Um, and, you know, when a leader fails, then some other, one of the other machines becomes a leader to, Take over. Um, and if you're not, if you're a follower, you're recording all the events, but you're not processing clients on that particular topic. Um, and yeah, you publish to, you know, where you want, and you can. Um, And so consumers, um, you can group consumers. And what that means is um, when you're in one consumer group, um, 
if you've got two consumers in, in the same group and they read from the same topic, they don't get the they can they're considered the one consumer. So if C one reads a top reads the topic, then when C two reads it, a record from the same topic, we they get the next one, not they don't get the same one. Right. So if you want um consumer group B here, um you know, if you really want to read all the data really fast, we can have more consumers in the group, right? Um, but then each each consumer in this group is not getting every single record. They're, they're each getting unique records. If you want all the consumers to get every record, then only have one consumer in each group, and then each consumer will get all the records in that topic. Um, now the problem is if you get multiple multiple producers writing to the same topic, um, things can get it out of order, right? Well, what what does it mean for two separate machines to do the same do this do something at the same time? What does the same time mean? Yeah, we don't know, right? Because there's we we need it takes time for those machines to send something to a third machine to figure out which one was faster, right? Um, and then it becomes how fast it goes from these two machines, I and mean, that could take different lengths of time. So the guarantee is the the record sent by a single producer are always in the correct order, right? If it was sent later by the producer, it's then stored later. But when we have different producers, right? Um, it, it could be that producer one sends produces something slightly after producer two, but in the in the queue, it's that message is first. There's no guarantee about how messages between different producers are stored, what order they're stored in, right? And the consumer can always see things as they in the order in which they are in in the queue. Um, and yeah, replication factor tells you how many machines can go down before you lose track, right? Um, Yeah, so if servers are writing the same topic with different writing different partitions, then Kafka makes no guarantee as to where they can appear, right? Um, Right, so you know, say we've got a bunch of web server processes, right? And we want to log their activity. Um, you know, we start getting right. Now, you know, each process can write to whatever partition it wants, right? Um, and so we have no idea how these things relate to each other now because they're different partitions, right? There's no way of, they do come with a timestamp, but when you read that topic, right, there's no guarantee um, which order they're gonna come in. And here, if you're trying to keep track of people's actions, you may want to decide which partition based upon the user, right? So that all user transactions are on the same partition. But 
Um, now, when you consume it, right, we don't, you know, these two partitions are different, so we have no idea what, um, when you read them, which is going to come, right? And if your messages really have to be sequential, then just use um, one partition for that topic. Otherwise, performance. This is this is a study done several years ago. Um, so they use six machines. Um, so they had three machines dedicated towards um, just doing Kafka. They had one machine, which was a zookeeper, which kept track of all the Kafka things and the configuration. They used um, three machines to generate the load to send to the system. Um, and each message was 100 bytes long, and they used six partitions across these three machines. Um, so one producer and replication of a partition, um, they will, you know, send 800,000 records per second, which is more than we could generate by ourselves. Um, sending eight, you know, almost 80 megabytes per second. Um, when they replicated the um, partition, the throughput went down a little bit. Um, when they used three producers and three async replications, um, they actually got a much higher throughput. Basically, be able to write to all three machines. Um, and so it's like, let's oh, see, hundreds, thousands, millions. Oh, that's seven billion records per hour. You need a Google or an Amazon or a Spotify or a company like that to. That was with, with three machines, right? Um, they also then looked at um, how much data did you, did you keep stored on the disk as opposed to how that affected throughput. Um, and this is a gigabyte, so we're looking at almost 1.5 terabytes of data, right? And the throughput, I mean, there's, there's noise, but we're not seeing any degradation due to the fact that the disk is getting full, right? And being able to consume the data, you know, one consumer is able to, you know, read almost almost a million records per second. Which is, I mean, and three consumers were able to get, right, a little two million records per second. So we're going to push a lot of data in, we can pull that data out, right? You know, I, I believe you, the server keeps track of which consume, where each consumer group is in its partitions. Um, and I believe you also get the record ID when you read it. The 
Kafka server knows where each consumer group is in each partition. Zookeeper doesn't, um, is only there to keep track of configuration files and whether Kafka is up and running or not. But the actual, the actual work is done by Kafka itself. A zookeeper is another, yet another Apache. It's used for other things, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then latency. Um, so on their setup, uh, the median time from, from the producer, produ you know, sending it to the consumer, reading it was two milliseconds. Um, three milliseconds got ninety nine percent, right? And well, there's a there's a long tail, but it's a very Small, I mean, right? And, and 14 milliseconds is not not bad, right? Um, yeah, and the partitions make it fast, right? Because now producers, multiple producers can be writing to this different partitions in the same topic at the same time. Um, and consumers can read from the same topic from different, different machines at the same time. Um, they also, um, the message itself are um, are written in binary format and they're, they're compressed. Um, that also saves time on the wire. Um, and it's, um, yeah, as far as coffee consumes, the message is bytes, this is bits, right? It doesn't worry about. All it knows is, you know, each message has its own ID, one, two, three, four, and it's a sequence of bits, that's it. Um, and it, yeah, it uses the file system, and you're just appending the files. Um, Again, this information is old because now, I mean, you're not going to use a hard drive anymore. I mean, pretty much everyone's gotten rid of those old fashioned silly platters spinning around and just use a solid state drive, um, which would be much faster. But I mean, their configuration, they had six drives and you're getting 600 megabytes per second, which is, I mean, that's a lot. Um, and, you know, using Linux, it's really optimized. To, you know, the read writes are really optimized. Um, and it's, um, you know, Got all those buffers, right? So when you write, there's on the buffer when you read. Um, Linux will actually also read from the buffer if it's right. And they don't like using Java because well, there's a there's a secret that people don't like to tell you about. Um,
Does anyone know how many bytes of overhead there are per Java object? People should look, you should, you should, someone should Google it, right? Um, this is per object, right? And then when you consider that objects have other objects as fields, it's like, oh, um, and so there's, you can consume a fair amount of memory just for the object overhead. And then you've got garbage collection, right? And what happens is like, oh, when you got this, when you're processing thousands or hundreds of thousands of requests per second, and if objects are involved and you then have to garbage collect, it's going to slow you down. Um, so they really, that's why they um, write to disk. I mean, just, we don't want, we don't want our data restored in these objects. We want them on a disk and um, get rid of that overhead. Um, has anyone found the number of bytes per? Sixteen bytes of overhead per object, right? Um, So if I have an integer object, how m that's 16 bytes for overhead, and how many bytes for the object, for the actual number? Four, right? Oh, wait, so it's four. If you're just throwing, if you actually put an integer into an array, or not an array, but a, an array list, you have to wrap it into an integer object. And so you've just, Increase the more memory you need by a factor of four. And then you have to add the overhead for the array list, right? And oh, wait, the array list has other objects inside of it too you don't know about. Um, and that's one reason why in the early days, um, when you were doing building applications for cell phones you avoided objects as much as possible because the overhead was there's too much overhead and, it, and the processor was too slow um um you know this is Um, yeah, typically, um, you know, what happens when you want to send a file, right? You got all this little, I mean, this is all this OS stuff you learned in 570. Um, I mean, first it's, you know, you got the file, we need to copy it and you put it in the, in the kernel space, but your application is not in the kernel space, it's in user space, so you have to then copy from kernel space to user space. So now we've, we've got two copies. Um, um, but then the application needs to take that from user space and put it in a network buffer, right? So now we've got three copies of the data, but then that um, we then have to copy that to, to the buffer on the actual chip to send it out, right? So you have to copy this thing four times. Um, and so the larger the file, like four copies, um, but Linux has this nice send file where you can actually have the operating system send it directly to the NIC buffer, right? So you reduce, you only copy it once instead of four times. It's like, oh, that's nice. Um, and then it turns out that um, you can then have this page cache where, oh, if consumers are pretty much caught up and they're just reading one of the latest things, the OS doesn't even have to go to the disk, it's in your page cache. And so you're not copying from hard drive, you're copying from the cache, right? 
into the neck buffer to send it out to them. It makes it really, really fast. And this is why every computer science student needs to take operating systems. Because when you start trying to push things, right, understanding what's going on becomes important because um, copying the thing four times, when you're trying to send two million records out per second, it's not gonna work, right? What's it? Um, yeah, send file, you know, is this, is this, well, it's probably, yeah, it's one of the C functions in the operating system, yeah. Oh, no, this is, this is, you know, a OS call. So next time we'll look at how we actually can start up a Kafka system and how we can actually send a message to it and then read a message from it. And then a week from today, we'll talk about projects.